Welcome to Pancreas School. I'm Dr. Doug Evans, and we're thrilled to expand Pancreas School uh, to our research laboratory today. You're going to hear from Dr. Nikki Lytle, an incredibly talented basic scientist who came to us from the Salk Institute in California uh, and is a key member of the Laban Pancreatic Cancer Program here at MCW. Uh, the laboratory is critical to make sure that we treat the patient of tomorrow even better than we're treating the patient of today. Enjoy today's episode. Here in the Lytle Lab at the Medical College of Wisconsin, we study a process known as metastasis, which is when cells leave a primary tumor, enter circulation, and then spread to distant organs throughout the body. This is a very challenging part of cancer medicine because we think that it happens very early in disease progression. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence that pancreas cancer patients have um, microscopic metastases in distant organs even prior to diagnosis. So even if a patient is considered early stage, stage one, stage two, maybe even surgically resectable, there's a high risk of those patients recurring with distant metastases even after treatment. So after they undergo chemotherapy with and without radiation and then surgery and seem to be disease free. So this really tells us that those tumor cells have spread to those distant organs and are sitting there and are resistant to all the treatments that we are delivering to patients. It's, it's a really um, enormous challenge for us to try and understand why those tumor cells are resistant and the, really trying to get at the biological mechanisms by which they can withstand all of the impact of, of all the different therapies we throw at it and then later um, begin to proliferate and outgrow into an entirely new tumor in a distant organ. So we use a num number of tools to study this process. And we, take, we approach it from two different angles. One is trying to understand the tumor cells themselves that are better able to survive treatment and later give rise to metastasis. And then we also try to understand the signals that come from the normal tissue around those tumor cells, also known as the local microenvironment or the metastatic microenvironment. And there's a lot of evidence that, that cells within the local microenvironment can signal to those tumor cells to help them survive therapies and later go on to proliferate and give rise to a metastasis. So we, we want to understand both the signals within the tumor cells and the signals in the microenvironment that contribute to this risk of metastatic relapse. So when we're studying the tumor cells themselves, we use a, pro, a number of tools in our lab, one of which is known as cell culture. So we can grow tumor cells in, in a dish in a media that contains a lot of those growth factors that, require, that is required for tumor cell survival and proliferation. So we can grow those cells in a dish, we can propagate them, we can treat them with chemotherapies, test how they respond to those chemotherapies, try to understand the, the, the phenotype of the tumor cell that can survive treatment and then later go on to, to proliferate and continue to grow. That's one way that we use it. Another tool that we use to study these tumor cells in a dish is something called tumor organoids. So rather than having the cells, what we call like in a two-dimensional space on a flat surface in a dish, we grow them in a three-dimensional um, manner in which a um, dome of extracellular matrix or fibers consisting of collagens and elastins and fibronectin um, allows for these tumors to grow in these small little tumor organoids or these mini tumors. And this process is closer to recapitulating the primary tumor than the cells that are grown in a two-dimensional space. And in fact, they, they, when they grow in this mini tumor, they become heterogeneous, meaning that not all the tumor cells are the exact same. And in fact, some of them are, are quite resistant to chemotherapies as compared to others. And using those tumor organoids, we can genetically engineer them to better be able to study them and their heterogeneity. One example of this is that we can put in a green fluorescent protein, or a GFP. And that means that every cell in that organoid will be expressing GFP. 
so that if we ever mix those organoids in with, let's say, a liver, we can now track the tumors in that liver as compared to the GFP negative cells that would be the normal liver cells. Another way that we can genetically engineer them, and one, one thing aspect of our lab that we're very interested in, is the communication between the liver cells and the pancreas tumor cells. And so we've created organoids that also express a lipid-soluble M cherry fluorescent protein, or a red fluorescent protein. And this fluorescent protein is very unique. It can readily cross from one cell to another cell and be taken up into the surrounding cells that are in close proximity. So now we can use this soluble red fluorescent protein that the tumor cells will make and secrete locally. And then the cells in the local microenvironment that I previously spoke about will take up that red fluorescent protein. And that allows us to be able to tag and track the, the normal cells that are communicating to those tumor cells. So once we have you know, our cell lines in a dish or our tumor organoids that we can challenge with different therapies and understand how they respond, we can actually now go into um, mouse models to understand how those tumors are able to seed distant organs and then eventually give rise to metastases. We're particularly interested in the liver for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that the liver is the most common site of metastasis for pancreas cancer patients. And intriguingly, those with liver metastases tend to have um, poor survival rates than metastases to other organs. So we really focus on how these tumor organoids seed the liver and then grow out and try to identify again, the, the microenvironmental niche components that, that contribute to that, as well as the tumor cells. So one example that I have showing right here is an example of a liver metastasis that's growing out and invading into the normal liver of a mouse. Here in dark red is some normal liver that remains. It um, is healthy and seems to be okay, but, but invading right up against it is a metastasis shown here that looks very chaotic. The cells are not organized. There's, there's what, what looks like a river of blue going throughout it. That's, that's the collagen and that extracellular matrix that we know the tumor loves to grow in. And it will deposit that extracellular matrix as part of the progression of the outgrowth of the tumor. So we, we can go in now and transplant in our tumor organoids and throughout early metastatic seeding, early outgrowth events, or even late metastatic disease, we can track how those tumor cells are growing and who they're interacting with within the liver using that lipid soluble M cherry. You know, one exciting finding that we've had recently is we found that, that using a mouse model that develops metastases in the liver much faster and dies uh, much quicker than the normal counterpart of that, that mouse model. Um, we compared the livers of that highly metastatic liver versus the normal, and we found that that highly metastatic liver is upregulated about tenfold for a protein called TIMP1. Now, TIMP1, intriguingly, um, negatively regulates a set of proteins called matrix metalloproteases that chew up that blue extracellular matrix shown there. So what we think is happening and what we're um, excited to, to continue to pursue is that high levels of TIMP1 suppressing those proteins that chew up extracellular matrix allows for increased extracellular matrix deposition and, and aggregation and that is one of the factors that promotes the survival of these tumor cells that reside in this high TIMP1 liver. And very excitingly, we're currently exploring uh, therapeutic avenues to block TIMP1 to see if we can reverse or slow um, metastatic progression in the liver. And finally, one thing that we, we use readily in the lab to be able to understand the cells that are interacting with the tumor cells, as well as the tumor cells themselves through our progression, is, is a tool called fluorescent activated cell sorting, or FACS, F-A-C-S. This is a, a very valuable tool we have where we can take out 
a liver that possibly harbors either microscopic metastases or macroscopic huge metastases. And we can dissociate all of that into what's called a single cell suspension. So now all of the cells in the liver and all of the cells in the tumor are in essentially a single cell fluid, if you will. And then we can label those cells with fluorescent antibodies to, to figure out what kind of cell they are, whether or not it's a, um, a hepatocyte that resides in the liver, or maybe your immune cells that, that um, could be infiltrated into the tumor or even excluded as part of a way for that tumor to continue to survive, or even isolate the tumor cells themselves to understand um, their phenotype throughout this progression. And using those um, fluorescently labeled cells, we can run it through this machine uh, called a flow cytometer. And that machine will um, capture the fluorescent signal on every cell at about 8,000 cells per second, and then tell us which cells are present and even allow us to sort them into tubes into pure populations so that we can conduct downstream assays such as um, transcriptomic profiling, proteomic profiling, or even functional assays to understand if, if the, some tumor cells we're capturing may be more um, able to drive metastasis versus other tumor cells. So this is a very powerful tool that we, we use to, to really deeply understand the phenotype of both the niche or that microenvironment as well as the tumor. As excited as we are in using our mouse models and our organoids to understand pancreas cancer progression uh, to metastasis, particularly in the liver, we, we understand that mouse models are not always perfect in terms of reflecting the true biology that occurs in a patient. So one of the enormous strengths here at the Medical College of Wisconsin is the, the amazing collaborative group of clinicians as well as uh, patients that are so willing to participate in our very valuable biobank and in the clinical trials that are ongoing. So this is actually one thing that really drew me here to MCW. I've been here for just a year and I've been absolutely blown away by how excited and supportive the clinicians and patients are to participate in research with the hope of identifying new therapeutic targets that can improve patient outcome in the future. So with that regard, Dr. Evans, for example, is, is just this fin phenomenal surgeon and somehow he finds the time to check in with me to see what tissues I need, what serum samples I need, what, what do I need to better understand how pancreas cancer spreads to the liver. Doctors Hall and Erickson, incredibly talented radiation oncologists, both of them are very excited to, to understand um, which cells are more responsive to certain radiation approaches over others, and more importantly, why some tumor cells are resistant to the radiation that we use currently in the clinic. And these are, these are um, projects that I can certainly help out with with our mouse models as well. Mm -hmm. And finally, Dr. Uh, Mandana Kamgar, she's been absolutely instrumental in, in sharing her very deep knowledge of how chemotherapies work and really thinking about chemotherapy in almost a personalized medicine approach depending on what mutations are present in a patient's tumor. So I have been so grateful and honored to work with this group here at MCW with, with the goal of eventually developing a new target that, that I hope can either slow or prevent metastatic progression in patients.